Howdy, howdy, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on another Friday night show. I am thrilled to be sharing tonight's episode of Text Trek with everyone. We have very special guest, Caitlin Hopkins, on the show. So that's going to be tons of fun. We recorded a great interview with her. Uh, unfortunately, it was just me. Dave was having technical issues, so I'm flying solo tonight. Dave couldn't make it, but she was still a real treat to talk to. You know, very exciting to talk to someone who has appeared on screen as multiple Star Trek characters. So I would just like to go ahead and get the show started. I'm Fathery, and this is Tex Trek. Engage. Welcome back aboard the Starship Texas for the 204th installment of the Text Trek podcast, the home of Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we take a deep look at Star Trek old and new. And tonight we're talking with Star Trek actor Caitlin Hopkins. She's appeared in both Deep Space Nine and Voyager. We have a great interview recorded with her that I am looking forward to sharing with everyone. Uh, just uh, real quick before I reveal that interview to all y'all. I just want to go over a few things. Uh, number one, first and foremost, as always, thank you so much to our Patreon supporters. We really appreciate all of our patrons. That's going to be Starfleet Boy, Cake is Eternal, Gay Clevin Lundstrom, Crazy Dutchie, Joe Ann Robertson, Quarks Bar, and our anonymous supporters. Thank you so much. Uh, we're actually, if you're watching this live on Friday, we're actually tomorrow on Saturday on August 20th. We're going to be doing our patron watch party that we do every month. It's going to be a double feature. We're going to watch the Lorelei Signal, the episode of the animated series where Uhura takes command. So in honor of Nichelle Nichols, we're going to be checking that out. And then we're going to follow that up with Wage Douge, the three ships episode of Star Trek Lower Decks to get us back in that, that Lower Decks mindset for season three coming out what next week so yeah speaking of that next week i will be at star trek las vegas i'm going to be gone we'll still get the show out we'll still talk about that season three premiere i'll have the mobile emitter uh, set up that that should be me and starfleet boy so uh, hopefully uh that will just continue on without a hitch and you know we'll continue to provide our weekly coverage of all the new episodes of star trek but if you're going to be at the convention in Vegas, please, by all means, say hi to me. Uh, I love you know talking to people that are fans of the show. If you listen to Text Trek, if you watch us on YouTube, whatever, you know, I, I would love to uh, just chat with you in person. So by all means, please uh, holler at me if you see me. I'm, I'm easy to find. I stand out in a crowd. Uh, but yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit play on this interview with the delightful Caitlin Hopkins. She has appeared in multiple Star Trek shows, played multiple characters, and uh, like I said, was just a, a, a real joy to have as a guest. So uh, here y'all go. Check it out. Hi, I am joined today by Mrs. Caitlin Hopkins. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Here, uh, joining us today is it is it Mrs. Caitlin Hopkins, or should I call you like professor or something? Like I know you're, uh, <laughs> I know you're an educator. I am. You don't have to call me professor. You can just call me Caitlin, and it's just Miss. I am. Okay, I am uh, married, but uh, but I use my maiden name professionally. Got it. Okay, that's that's pretty common in the uh, the actor world, right? It is, isn't it? Well, uh, thank you for joining us. You played two different characters in Star Trek. You appeared in Deep Space Nine season five, episode two, the ship as the Vorta Kalana, and then in Voyager. Season six, episode 21, Live Fast and Prosper. You were the con artist, gang leader, Janeway impersonator, Dala. So yes. uh, that's really cool. And 
Uh, just looking at your career, it looked like you did the the East Coast thing, you did the West Coast thing, and now you are living uh, here in Texas, just like here in Texas, down the, which the I like, road from which me. I like to call the Third Coast. The Third Coast, okay, yeah, we well, we have a a big <laughs> coastal region, me so too. well, you know, it's like East Coast, West Coast, Texas. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know too much about like as far as the industry presence in, in San Marcos. I know like Austin used to be pretty big with like movies and stuff being shot here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm in Austin. Yeah, there's still still quite a bit, you know, quite a bit going on in Texas. And actually, interestingly enough, in San Marcos, which is where I am, because I am mm -hmm. uh, I run the musical theater program at Texas State University um, for the last 13 years. There's a, there's starting to be even more film and television in this area. Having said that, um, you know, I, I don't participate in that just because I've been really focused on um, teaching and directing mm -hmm. and uh, producing. And so um, I haven't, haven't performed in quite a while. I, I like to support my students and their performing. <laughs> sure. Cool. Well, I'd like to just talk to you about the, relationship you have with star trek was it something that you were ever aware of or did you ever watch oh, yeah. star trek or know anything about it before you oh you worked on it yeah no it was actually um, a huge part of my childhood uh i we spent about 10 years in in england and my stepfather was a huge just massive trekkie the original the original star trek series and it was quite a big event in our family to sit down and watch star trek every week so um, I sort of grew up uh, with the original series and, um, you know, grew to love it and have a have a passion for it uh, through my dad. It was something that we shared together. Um, and so, you know, years dissolved to years later when I moved to Hollywood and I was pursuing being an actress. One of my dream jobs, I mean, just the job I wanted more than anything was to be on one of the Star Trek shows. So when I finally had an opportunity um, to audition, it was a pretty big deal in my house. <laughs> uh, my dad was really excited. Um, I actually remember how much time I spent picking out my outfit and I mean, just working on the scenes. And um, I remember, I, I literally remember everything about that day, like going to Paramount and you know, going into the casting office, I just remember every minute of it like it was yesterday because it was it was such a big event for me. So then to book it, right? That was um, that was pretty exciting. So it was it was a it was a very significant moment for me because I'd grown up in show business and I had worked a lot and um, but there were very few sort of shows and people that I had a, a dream about working with, you know. Um, and this was one of them. So I, I feel very lucky that I had that opportunity. Oh, well, wow. yeah, that is really cool. And so I guess you got it on, on your, your first attempt to get on Star Trek. Your first Star Trek audition was that was the Deep Space Nine one, right? I did. Isn't that crazy? Like, I, I thinking back on it now, like, I think I auditioned for Law & Order probably 20 times before I actually booked an episode. <laughs> And so to have actually booked it on the first on the first try was was really exciting. And then, you know, not not too long after that, they they asked me if I would do the Voyager episode. So um, I felt like, oh, gosh, I guess they must have been pleased. I must have done well. You know, they've asked me to be on another show. Yeah, that's really cool. I know a lot of times people after they get their foot in the door or, or back then when there was so much Star Trek in production, you know, a lot of not just like with actors that they would use again and again, but there were a lot of, uh, you know, writers, uh, directors. So there was that whole Rick Berman era of Star Trek from 87 to 2005. Like it, it gave a lot of people a lot of work. Yeah, they I mean, they were very loyal, you know, and, um, and I felt particularly lucky because um, the character that I played on Deep Space Nine they were really experimenting with what did they want her to look like and um you know they were making sort of some changes to the female vorta you know and and sort of what um the direction that they wanted to head with that and so it was really really fun because i got to try on a lot of different uh 
you know, sort of variations on the same costume, variations on the same wig. Um, the first one, they thought it was too harsh. They wanted it softer. They wanted it a little sexier. Um, same with the costume. You know, they, they really sort of um, played around with, with what she looked like uh, before, before we shot. So I had quite a few opportunities to go um, on the uh, Paramount lot uh, to have costume fittings and whatnot. And like one of my favorite, literally like this was, I almost, I thought I was going to pass out. It was so exciting. So when they took me to the fitting room, there was this huge, I mean, I, I remember it as huge. I don't know how big it was, but it was like a massive um, hangar space, almost like a soundstage. And they had uh, the same type of electric um, uh, thingies <laughs> that they have in dry cleaners. You know, that, that um, like the tracks, the electric tracks that like bring the clothes around. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. This entire um, hangar was filled with all of the Star Trek costumes. Like oh, wow. thousands of them, thousands of them. And they would like press the little button and it would, you know, go around and you would see like all of these Star Trek costumes just, you know, flying mm -hmm. by. And I couldn't even believe it. I was like, oh my gosh. And, you know, it was all documented and um, they have like a whole, well, I'm sure you know, you know, a whole Star Trek Bible for just everything, you know, down to the last detail. So uh, it was pretty exciting to get to right. see all that. Yeah, and they didn't throw anything away back in those days. They would they would mm -hmm. reuse so much. Like if if you go back and watch a lot of the shows, you'll see something like, oh, they have this wardrobe in this episode of Next Generation, and then it shows up again in Voyager and stuff like that. So they, <laughs> yeah, they were very well, economical. <laughs> yes, they were. I mean, you know, those are pretty big budget shows, so I'm not surprised things showed up again. You know, um, I had no idea that in the in some of the um, may have been all of it, but in some of the uh, uniforms. So there were like pecs built in, built in and shoulder pads built in, mm -hmm. which I just thought was so interesting. Um, so I, you know, I guess they wanted actors to look really fit, even if they perhaps weren't as fit as they wanted us to be. <laughs> well, every, everyone were, looked good. You know, everyone looked everybody good. Everybody did look good. <laughs> So just yeah. talking about your uh, Deep Space Nine episode, and I have some I have some pictures here. Oh my goodness! Yes, uh, you do. But, uh, back uh, back when y'all were shooting this episode, I've I've heard it was like really kind of a, a nightmare being out there in the desert on on location just because of how hot it was. It was really hot. It was really hot. I. Don't remember exactly how hot, but for some reason, 113 degrees is like in my memory. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but we were in the desert. We we're in the middle of nowhere. And um, they had put a metal ship in this quarry. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we stood on it, um, all of that heat, you know, was wafting off of that metal. Um and, you know, when you've sat and, you know, I sat in makeup for four hours, like two o'clock in the morning um, was my call time. And, you know, you're afraid your ears are going to melt off your face. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the two guys, uh, there was a gentleman, one of the gentlemen playing a gentleman who was behind me in one of the shots. Um, it got so hot at one point that, you know, we're shooting and I sudden I hear this big like clunk behind me. And I hear the director yell, cut. And I turn around and the poor guy passed out. I mean, you know, those those um, costumes are all rubber. Right, right. Yeah, it and doesn't breathe at all. really breathable. And so, yeah, he just went down like a tree. And I remember like running around to the other side of where the director was because they have like little um, miniature TVs where they can watch the playback. And I, I ran mm -hmm. ran back to, to watch the playback. And I mean, I felt terrible for him, but it really was quite funny <laughs> to see the footage over playing the scene. And this huge guy behind us just suddenly just falls like a tree, just goes clunk <laughs> out of frame. 
Um, so it was hot, but it was fun. It was really, really fun. They had, I remember they had a bucket of ice with like um, chamois claws in them and they would soak them in sea breeze and ice and they would put them around the back of our necks and on our wrists to cool us down. Um, I can't believe I remember that. I only just remembered that right now because you were mentioning how, how hot it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish that they would have released that footage as like a, a blooper reel or something of a Jim Hadar passing out in the desert or something that how often do you see something like that, you know? Yeah. I wish they'd kept some of the footage on um, on the Voyager episode because the episode ran long, but I actually have uh, I impersonated a couple different, you know, people in the in the episode. Um, Captain Janeway, that footage was still in there, but I also impersonated Seven of Nine. And that costume and wig and like getting to dress up like Miss Cherry, oh my goodness, that was fun. And the scene was really great. So I was so sad when they had to cut it. Wow. I, I had wish, no idea I wish that would that. magically, I wish that would magically resurface. <laughs> that is really cool. Yeah. I've not heard that before. It, mm. It's odd that episode. I suspected there might've been something deleted because Jerry Ryan is not in that episode very much. I think, I think she only shows up briefly in like one scene. And that's kind of odd. They, they typically gave her a lot of screen time, you know, for obvious mm. woman, or obvious reasons, you know, like gorgeous woman and everything, but uh, yeah, so I that that kind of explains a lot that they they had more seven of nine stuff. So they yeah, did. that and I was really sad when it went away. I was like, oh dang it. <laughs> well, let's talk about that Voyager episode a little oh, bit. I, I've heard from multiple actors say that because Voyager was a, a network show, they had like more money. They had the kind of nicer conditions. The the regulars all had like better trailers. The the catering was better. I heard that actually like a lot of the Deep Space Nine actors, they would sneak over to the Voyager sets because the catering was Dude, better. That's hysterical. Well, you know, on Deep Space Nine, we were on location. So right. I didn't have the opportunity to um, sample the difference on the catering. <laughs> um, sure. And because I was only there for the one episode, I can't really speak to, you know, trailers and things. Uh, um, but I can say that it was a, I mean, both sets were really happy sets. Like every, you know, sometimes you work on television sets and people are tired and cranky and, you know, it's not necessarily a, a happy environment, you know, but um, both of those Star Trek sets, man, th that, that was just a lot of happy people and grateful people and people who were friendly and welcoming and um, laughing a lot you know, enjoying um, the process of creating this really amazing show. You know, it was just a blast. Well, I know you had a lot of scenes with uh, Ethan Phillips on Voyager and also uh, Kate Mulgrew on, on Deep Space Nine. Uh, you were you were mainly just acting against Avery Brooks, right? Yes. So w what was that experience like? Can you talk about both those leads, uh, Avery Brooks and Kate Mulgrew, uh, what what were those experiences like, just with the two of them being like, you know, the big captains of a yeah. Star Trek show? Well, they were both so generous. I mean, you know, Avery Brooks is one of my favorite actors, um, wonderful theater, Shakespearean actor, you know. So um, in terms of playing the scenes, it felt like like flying i mean when you're in a scene with an actor of that caliber that's actually you know listening and responding to what you're doing and you're able to just sort of really be in the moment and create um create something special together uh it, it, it's just an amazing feeling right i mean it, it it really well i will say that episode was particularly well written the script was excellent and so brave i thought it was a brave script to have two people just standing there talking negotiating through most of an episode not a whole lot happened um and so i i thought that that was actually really unique to that episode and i was very proud to be part of it the thing that i loved about working with avery was that we had such good chemistry um and i felt that we really, really played off each other well. In fact, 
I, I wish they had brought the two of them together again in some other episode, because I think it would have been really interesting to see where that relationship um, would have led to, because they clearly liked each other, you know, they were, they, uh, and, and so I just, I, I thought that that was, that was particularly unique about that episode. And in terms of uh, working with Kate, that's just a blast, man. She's just hilarious. Um, we just, yeah, we just had a lot of fun. I mean, she's um, she's such an incredible uh, actress and leader. You know, um, it was it was just really really fun to to be in scenes with her. Um, it was hard not to laugh a lot. Like I found myself, you know, getting the giggles a lot. You know, it's really hard to stand opposite Kate McGrew and say, welcome to the Federation <laughs> and be, you know, making fun of, of the character. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was great. It was, it was different because we were inside and it was air conditioned. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm sure a lot nicer. <laughs> it was just easier. It was just easier. But, you know, Afer and I would, you know, in between scenes, we would cool off in the in the trailer they had and talk about Shakespeare and theater and, you know, just kind of hang out. Cool. Yeah, I uh, wish that, you know, I, I could meet Avery Brooks, but he doesn't do conventions or anything anymore. So mm -hmm. it's uh, kind of a. I, I'm always disappointed I didn't get out to to see him. Um, but that's really cool to hear what he was like between between takes, because I heard he was kind of a, I don't know, like kind of an intense dude, you know, especially like when he's when he's acting like he uh, he, he has a lot of energy when he's performing and stuff. Well, he's smart, you know, he's he's saving it for the camera. You know, um, we had quite a bit in common just because my my mother um had been a very well-known actress her name was shirley knight she passed away a couple years ago and um she and avery uh, knew each other and you know so we you know my whole family had sort of been in show business and and so we had a lot to talk about you know which was nice um but yes you know i he is somebody who i, I wouldn't say intense i would say reserved right like he's okay. he was somebody who um was a very focused wanting to stay focused so that when he was in front of the camera he could be present with that you know he wasn't there to socialize he was there to to do his work as well he should be so um i really respected that and i was excited by that because it meant um you know that we could really um have a dynamic relationship on camera you know it's it's hard being on a set from two in the morning until you know you lose the light at night and retain the energy that you need on camera if you're expending it off camera being social and laughing and you know um mucking about so uh it was nice just to sort of sit sit quietly and and chat you know in between things when we had the opportunity and you said that you wish that they would have brought your character back on Deep Space Nine so you could have had more scenes with Avery. Was that ever something that they had ever talked to you about as far as like potentially bringing her back? No, I just had hope. Once I saw the episode, um, I knew it felt good when we were doing it, but you never know what it's going to end up um, like when you see it later. But when I when I watched it, I just remember thinking, oh, this is this is a really interesting, great dynamic that these two characters have. And they left it in such a way that if they did come back together, you know, they would be well met again. It would be like, oh, hey, I know you. <laughs> you know, um, Yeah. So I just hope that that uh, that they would want want to see them interact again and see what would happen. That's interesting. Yeah. At interesting. one point I actually thought that that Kalana appeared in more than one episode because I, I watched it when it originally <laughs> aired. I, I watched all of DS9. I missed the first couple seasons, but by the time this episode came out, I was watching week to week. And for some reason, I just thought that your character showed up more than one time. And then when the DVDs came out and I watched it again, I was like, oh, no, I guess she was only in one episode. But I, I think you were uh, you were kind of unique among the other 
Vorta. Like like you said, you know, they wanted you to have a, a sexy look. I think I think that was something they didn't allow any of the the other actors uh, playing the the Vorta. So I, I I think it would have been cool if they would have used you more. But I, I know they really fell in love with what Jeffrey Combs was doing. And he kind of took over the, the Vorta role, you know, going he forward. He did. He did. I mean, I probably didn't, you know, I remember now, like, the the outfit I wore to the audition was a very, very short um, kind of 60s vibe mini dress that was violet colored. Um, and if you notice all of her accents, her her eyes, her eyeshadow, um, everything is, is kind of violet hued um, in the character on camera. And so, you know, I don't know if I helped inspire <laughs> <laughs> the let's go a little sexier with the Vorta vibe because I did show up in a very short mini dress. Um, but, you know, it was my homage to the original series because that's right, what sure, I had yeah. grown up on. And the dress was like literally like something I had seen in one of those early Star Trek shows. So sure. My, well, that was kind of the thing. uniform. That was kind oh, of the uniform in the original totally. series was the short dresses. <laughs> that's right. I thought, thought it was very appropriate. Well, speaking of makeup, let's talk a little bit about like the the prosthetics that you had to wear in in both shows. So that was that was a wig in in DS Nine. Uh huh. Okay. It was a wig in both both shows. I was going to ask about that because yeah, you have like the the Kate Mulgrew hair. In, I have the Kate Mulgrew hair. That's right. Yeah. They I know. I know. Sometimes to... you're just in the bald cap without the without the mm -hmm. wig on. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they were both wigs and the Deep Space Nine ears took a while to, you know, get them on and perfect. And they had had me in for a um, contact fitting and they made a pair of hard contacts that were hand painted violet. Like they were very beautiful. They were very hard to wear. They were so painful. And of course, it was very sandy and dusty out in the desert. Um, so that was rough. Uh, but it took me some time to even get those dang things in my eyes. Um, but yeah, primarily with that, it was the ears and the, and the contact lenses. And then they, they airbrushed a lot of the, the detail uh, on my face. Uh, and with the Voyager character, same thing, you know, they, they, they use a lot of airbrushing uh, with the makeup, um, which is really great because it looks, it just looks gorgeous and, and uh, finished, you know, you don't tend to see the edges of the wigs or the edges of the uh, bald cap, you know, for this character or anything like that. Um, they add a lot of detail with the airbrushing. Which one took longer? Um, Honestly, I don't remember, but I think the deep space font, deep space nine one, is, I remember taking longer. You know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people that are regulars on on these shows, they have to do the uh, you know the prosthetics every day that they work for years and years at a time. They have a lot of a uh, they have a lot of horror stories about having to spend so much of their life sitting in that makeup chair every day. Yeah, I I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't. It's one thing to do it, you know, for a week or 10 days, but for years, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that must be very challenging. I, I think know, you learn uh, how to meditate. You learn how to meditate <laughs> in the makeup chair, you know? Yeah, sure. I, uh, speaking of, uh, Ethan Phillips, I know, um, on, on Voyager playing Neelix, he had to spend a lot of time getting that, yes. uh, getting those prosthetics on and off every day. Uh, do, he's a real funny guy and, you know, in real life, I've seen him at conventions and stuff. He's he's kind of a big, goofy, jokey guy. Do you do you remember having a lot of fun with him when y'all were shooting oh, y'all yeah. stuff together? Yeah, he's just kind of the life of the party. <laughs> so um, yeah, he was just really funny and welcoming, um, and just fun to be around. You know, uh, made you feel right at home and and like you'd you know always been there, which was nice. You know, it's nice to feel like you're part of something. And I, I don't know if you have thought of this, but you technically play the Voyager doctor for a little bit when when he's impersonating your character. Mm -hmm. 
So did you have any conversations with Robert Picardo about like how to how to go about that? Or was that just all yeah, you doing not the, that? I, doing all not that? that I remember. I mean, I, I was a huge fan of that show, too. So I had seen every episode before, before I ever shot that that show, um, just because I was a big fan of it beforehand. Um, so I felt like I really knew all the characters pretty well. OK. Mm -hmm. So he's he's great on Voyager. I, th I think he's one of the one of the best performers in all of of Star Trek. He did some really cool stuff mm -hmm. with that character. Yep, indeed, agreed. Uh, but you worked with the uh, directors, I believe, uh, Kim Friedman on DS Nine and Lavar Burton mm -hmm. on Voyager. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, yeah, both of them are incredible incredible directors <laughs> they both have done so much television uh, over the years but yeah i mean I, I i lucked out seriously like to have two of the top directors on those shows to get to work with them was amazing like an actor's dream yeah I've, I've noticed recently just going back and looking at these episodes and seeing who directed what but uh, mm -hmm. kim friedman did a lot of the uh action heavy episodes Mm -hmm. um, things that had like, you know, a lot of people running around shooting at each other and stuff like that. So I'm not surprised that they gave her the the ship because like you were saying, a lot of it is just people talking to each other. But there is, you know, some stuff you have Jim Adar running oh. around and yeah, worth shooting people, people and shooting stuff, each so. other. Yeah. When there's action, there's a lot of action in like small spaces. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, she was terrific. I mean, I I. Would love to have worked with her down as well. And LeVar, I mean, come on. They're both, they're both like legends. Yeah, LeVar directed a lot of the, not just Voyager, but a lot of DS9 episodes. And that was another thing I noticed lately is like, oh, wow, like a lot of these I really like were directed by LeVar Burton. So he's, he's pretty good, you know, behind the camera as well as in front of it. Oh, that's great. He just gets it. He, he really understands storytelling. He's just a great storyteller whether he's in front of the camera or behind it. And I'm curious now, you said that you were a fan of a Voyager before you were on it. So just with, with Star Trek in general, out of all the different shows, all the different episodes and characters, is there anything that like really stands out to you as like your particular favorite? Did you have like a favorite show or a favorite character out of the entire franchise? Mm. I wouldn't say favorite because that would be hard because I liked <laughs> all of them. What about some of your favorites? You can, you can say two or three. If that makes it easier. Okay. Well, I think that the writing on Deep Space Nine was incredible. I loved Next Generation. I was a big fan of Next Generation. And I'll tell you why. Because I was on an international tour for a year. I was doing an opera and it was one of the only shows. It didn't matter what country we were in, it was playing. <laughs> and so I got really hooked on Next Generation, you know, watching episodes in Hamburg and Paris and what have you, because um, it was one of the only things that, that I could watch that I knew. And so I got very attached to, to that show. Um, yeah, I love Jean-Luc Picard. Can't help it. I do. He's so good. Yeah, I Patrick just, Stewart you know, is great. Oh, my God. I just could watch him read the phone book. He's just so compelling. And he makes such interesting choices, and he makes unexpected choices. And I think, you know, the whole Star Trek franchise, like, that's really... Um, I don't know just part of the tone right is that you don't you don't always know what's going to happen and what's coming and he just keeps it fresh and i just love that um gosh what else and you know i mean who doesn't love the original i mean that's what i grew up watching so <laughs> um so I'm, I'm a little partial to that as well yeah I'm a, I'm a big fan of the original series and deep space nine those, those are my two favorites but yeah. uh, Yep. I just remember Patrick's... just always being grateful, like that they came out with another series, right? That like it was the gifts that kept giving. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially lately, they they have five shows in production now. Oh, I know. 
one of my friends, Kenneth Lynn, works on them. And I just, I, I just love all of them. I love all, I watch, have my husband and I watch all of them. In fact, the other night he was mad because we had watched all the episodes and there was nothing else to watch. We had to wait for, you know, whenever the next one's going to come up. <laughs> well, it, it won't be long. If I don't know if you watch the, uh, the animated shows, but the uh, Lower Decks, the Mike McMahon show that's uh, coming back in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you know, that was such a uh, large amount of, of content back in the I guess eighties and nineties during that Rick Berman era. And I feel like we're kind of getting back to that now after the last few years. So uh, that's, that's really cool. I know. I love it. Now I have a friend, like I said, that's working on the shows. And so I'm kind of secretly hoping like somehow they'll bring me back for an episode. I'll play a different <laughs> character. Yeah. Just like, I want to come to another show, you know, another episode or something. Who did you say was your your friend that's on one of the shows now? Oh, Kenneth Lynn. He's one of the writer producers. Okay, on on what show? Like m multiple ones. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> it seems like every time I watch an episode, you know, I, I see his name there, and I'm like, dang, I gotta really really like, reach out to him on Facebook and be like, hey, listen, <laughs> while you're while you're busy producing and writing these episodes. <laughs> Don't forget about. Oh, I, I got the I got the episode that you need to pitch to them. It would be like, oh, okay. what if, what if, Kalana and Dala met each other and they like go against each other. Yes, yes, I like it. Who do you think would win in that confrontation? Kalana. It wouldn't even be a contest. <laughs> <laughs> She would slay her. She would slay her with her wit and her sarcasm and her words. And uh, Dala would be bringing up the rear, struggling. Yeah. Kalana also has like a army of Jim Hadar behind her, so I'm sure that would help. Well, well, sure, there's that. Yeah. I'm glad you gave a definitive answer to that question. I I had prepared that earlier. I was going to ask you that and I was wondering if you were, you would just be like, oh, well, I really love both characters. So I don't know. But no, nope, you're just like, no hesitation. Kalana would win. OK, so there we well, go. I mean, I do. I do love both characters, but that wasn't what you asked me. Right. You right. asked me which one I thought would win in a fight. And I just don't think there would be a contest. <laughs> I think Kilana would like slay her, you know, from the beginning. I just don't think Dolly would stand a chance. Dolly would, would give it a good fight, you know, and she would think she was going to win, that she was going to outsmart her somehow. But Kilana was a much uh, smarter character. She was more strategic. Like to me, the ship was like watching a really good game of chess. You know, she was, she was like a great chess player. Right, is the way right. I thought of Kilana, right? And, um, you know, Dala was just a con artist. There, yeah, I'm not sure small there's potatoes. any strategy. Yes, yeah, small potatoes. I'm not sure there's any strategy <laughs> in in her conning. Sure, yeah, it was a smart con. It was a clever idea. I, I got to give the writers credit for thinking of thinking that up. Yeah. And I honestly, I think I got that job just because I impersonated Kate Mulgrew and in the room, I made them laugh, you know, uh, doing a Kate Mulgrew impersonation. Really? Okay. Uh, I didn't know that the the actor um, Garrett Wong, who played a Harry Kim on Voyager, I've, I've heard him do a Kate Mulgrew impersonation. That's actually pretty hilarious. Well, I literally just said, welcome to the Federation. And they just <laughs> lost it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I just booked this. <laughs> and the, the way that uh, you looked and the, the fake Tuvok actor looked in the, in the wardrobe where it's kind of like bad Star Trek cosplay where it's not, not quite screen accurate, but you get what they're going for. It's just, it was really funny. I thought it was a really great idea. I thought I had a great sense of humor to it that episode. It was fun. You know. Well, let me ask you about the work you're doing now as an educator. Do you ever have students who say like, oh, yeah, I know who you are. You were in the Star Trek episode or is, I don't know if like oh. Star Trek's cool with the young people these <laughs> days. Star Trek is very cool with the young people. And uh, and yes, my my students are um, very familiar with my career. 
<laughs> that is awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. A couple of them in particular are huge Star Trek fans and their parents are huge Star Trek fans. So that's always fun. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad to hear that because like I I'm I'm in my late 30s, but I I work with a lot of people that are in their like early 20s and a lot of them like uh, are kind of curious about Star Trek, but not many of them are like very like hardcore fans of it. So I'm thinking now with having the new shows and production, it's kind of getting uh, more popular yeah, now. So. I, I think so. I mean, those new shows are so good. Just the the writing is incredible. The storylines are great. The characters are great. Um, and the production values. I mean, sometimes you watch it and you're like, you can't even believe you're watching television. You're like, this is a movie. Right, um, yeah. You know, it really feels like multi-million dollar budgets, which I'm sure they have. <laughs> um, but they're they're really very impressive. You know, I love watching them. I don't know. It's a, you know, the thing I like about Star Trek is it, it truly is an escape. Like you feel when you watch Star Trek, it really allows you to escape kind of the way a good book does. Um, and, but it also has a moral compass, right? I love that it has a moral compass. I love that it has, in, the, the characters have integrity um, and that that is more important to them you know, that that is a driving principle. Like, I, I love that. Like, I don't need to watch another TV show where women are getting, like, raped, beaten, and murdered. Like, I, you know, I don't need to put that narrative out into the world, right? <laughs> and so I, I really appreciate um, the imagination and the care uh, that, and the thoughtfulness that goes into the type of narratives that they are putting out to the world. And if you're, and they were way ahead of the curve, if you want to talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, um, they were writing to that and hiring actors um, to that uh, long before, you know, our industry was saying, Hey, you know, we really should hire uh, actors of color and we really should give more opportunities. Um, so, so, you know, that just makes me respect them and love them even more. You know, that they have for many, many years um, been putting a very positive narrative into the world and, um, you know, making good TV at the same time. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, they really have been, you know, ahead of the curve. If you look at a lot of the other, especially going back to the 60s, you know, like other oh, stuff yeah. that was in production back then and. No, like it's not something that I think I really thought of a lot when I was younger watching the old original series episodes. But then when I got like a little bit more of an understanding of history and stuff, I was like, oh, yeah, the 60s. Yeah. That was shortly after World War Two in the 40s. And they have this <laughs> Japanese dude on the bridge. And, you know, they have a guy playing a Russian and a, a, a black woman in the middle of the civil rights movement. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that That's actually right. is like really and impressive. And when you're talking about gender equality, right, they had women in positions of power. Um, they also, um, they were, were just so inclusive. They also were um, challenging gender norms way back and like years and years ago, you know, um, with all the different species that weren't necessarily male or weren't necessarily female, right, but were maybe uh, non-binary and you know they were they weren't um, doing it in a preachy way or a political way or anything they just were being more diverse and inclusive uh, and open in their thinking and uh, you know we didn't always have um, a white savior right leading a white male guy uh, like winning everything Right. I loved when Kate Mulgrew came into our lives and when Avery Brooks came into our lives. You know, we had uh, captains that were of different ethnicities and genders. That was cool. Yay, Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, part of the reason why it has such a broad appeal to so many, 
so many different types of people is because it's always had that inclusive philosophy baked into it. Yeah. And it's inspiring to like, to a little girl, you know, I was like, Oh, could I, could I grow up and be a strong woman who could stand up for herself? Like that, you know, that's the message it was sending me. It wasn't sending me, Oh, you're going to be victimized as a woman there. They were like, you're going to win. You, you can be sexy and strong and uh, you can be in control and power. You can boss people around. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Well, bossing people around can be fun. So, I, you know, I'm, I am a big proponent of bossing people. Ask my students. They'll tell you. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. I want to, ask you a little bit about like the the work okay. you're doing now at um at texas state so like post star trek just uh you know the mm -hmm. career that you have now as an educator is there anything you'd like to tell people about uh what you're doing these days oh goodness um well i educate young artists uh who want to go into the industry and it's the most oh gosh the most rewarding thing i've ever done I feel very lucky to do something that I love every day for people I love with people I love. I've got an incredible faculty and, and students. Um, we recruit students from all over the world and have the top talent in the country here. I think I have about close to 900 applicants a year and we take 14 students. So you can imagine how competitive it is. Oh, wow. Um, and I love it. And, you know, since I've been here, I also, um, I started a, a dry mouth lozenge company called Fontis, uh, which was originally I designed it for singers because I was I did a lot of you know Broadway, off Broadway musicals and national tours and what have you. Um, I was also a singer, and there wasn't really a throat lozenge on the market that was good for singers, right? Because most of them have sugar and menthol and all kinds of crap in them. Huh. And so I designed a a dry mouth lozenge that's actually become very successful, which I'm really pleased about. It's uh, doing well, not just uh, in the performing arts market, but also in the medical market. Uh, there's a lot of need, for a lot of people who suffer from dry mouth, from medications, from chemo, from all kinds of things. So um, so I've been, you know, running that company as well as, as teaching. And then I also started uh, a company. Well, well, hold on, hold on. Can you, you tell us the name of that that product in case uh, oh, sure. you, know, go ahead, you can go it's... ahead and plug it, promote it if you want. <laughs> You're so sweet. Um, well, yeah, check it out. It's called Fontus, and that is spelled F-O-N-T-U-S, Fontus, drymouth.com. And uh, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and, and on our website, fontusdrymouth.com. And we have okay, cool. green apple and lemon and blood orange flavors. And they're nice. all natural, like glycerin and aloe and... Uh, I mean, they're, they're so good. I wish I could like send them to all your people watching the podcast so they could try them, but they're wonderful if you have dry mouth. Um, and then I also started a company called Living Mental Wellness and livingmentalwellness.com is, um, is a website where you can learn more about it if, if any of your viewers are interested. Um, but it's an educational program that I designed uh, to help people be mentally healthier through a develop scientific developmental model that actually um, we did about 10 years of research uh, that proved that if we increase people's life skills, meaning um, time management skills, goal setting, coping skills, communication skills, leadership skills, problem solving skills, when you increase life skills, it significantly decreases anxiety, depression, um, and, uh, and helps people just function better. And so it was something that we started uh, initially here with my students and also with the athletics program here. And um, it was so successful uh, that we started being asked to provide it to high schools and middle schools and uh, corporations and all kinds of things. So I actually um, travel all over the country quite a bit doing presentations and uh, certain, certifying educators to teach this curriculum and people can access it online. There, uh, we've created video modules so that anybody in the world can, can have access to it if they want. Um, but it's a really, really terrific um, curriculum 
basically uh, seven seven video modules uh, that help people uh, navigate their daily stress better. Because who doesn't need help navigating their daily stress better? That's what I think. Right. right? Like, who doesn't need a little, a little help with that? <laughs> Especially in the pandemic, right? I kept hearing everybody was, you know, mentally and emotionally really, really having a tough time. And I was like, I have something that can help you. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's really cool. I, I didn't realize you, you were so busy. Sounds like you have a lot of stuff going on. You know, I like to build stuff. I don't know. I, I, I guess I get bored easily. I don't know. The <laughs> program that I run at Texas State, I created the degree plan. So I, I built it from scratch. It's a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in musical theater specifically. Um, and I created the degree plan in fall 2009. So. Cool. Yeah, Texas State is a really, uh, really good school. I uh, know a lot of people who who went to school there because I'm I'm from around here. So, actually, when I was oh, in my twenties, okay. I had a when I was in my <laughs> yeah when I when I was in my twenties, I had a girlfriend who was a student there, and um, yeah, they uh, people like to kids like to party over there. You know, they did in the day. Like, I, it's so funny because it's not like that now. And so, oh really? It's always curious to me because uh, I okay. meet people who are sort of your age and older right um and they're always like oh yeah that's a party school and i was like mm, not anymore it's really hard to get into now <laughs> well, mellowed and, out a little bit yeah well mellowed a lot so uh i guess that you know it's an old reputation and, uh, but my students are all smarty pants so they're all graduating like magna summa cum laude with minors and you know going out into the world and being on TV shows and on Broadway, and they're doing great. My alumni are killing it. Oh, that's I'm awesome! So proud of them. You know they they have your school in the uh, the new Beavis and Budhead. They brought them back on on Paramount Plus. They they just brought that cartoon from the '90s back, and they actually mm -hmm. they they go to they're at, like at the quad, like walking around. They like go into classrooms and stuff. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious i remember beavis and Bethan. that's hilarious that they go to the quad and, yeah yeah so i was, I was surprised oh, to see yeah, that yeah. but yeah i'm surprised okay <laughs> but i i think that's all the the questions i had for you just um it was really cool getting a chance to to talk to you and talk to you about like these characters and also the work you're doing now still you know in the acting world, but as, as an educator, I think it, it kind of is thematically appropriate that one of the characters you played was herself an actor, right? Cause Dala was like always performing sure. as other people. So you yeah. had to be an actor playing an actor. That's right. That's I don't know right. What, you, what you would call that. That's like meta acting. It's a <laughs> That's right. It's funny. I find uh, I direct the musicals here a lot uh, so that I direct my students as well as teach them. And it's so, it's really, I have to say, I love being on the other side of the table. I haven't, I can't say I've missed acting. I mean, I would probably do it again if somebody asked me, but, um, but it's, it's so fulfilling to work with young artists who are going to go out, and, go out and change the world with their, their storytelling. That's awesome. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Right. Is finding whatever that, yeah. that fulfillment comes from, but, Thank you so much for uh, spending this time with okay. all of us. And if if your students are like out there, like getting like these big jobs and they're like on uh, shows and movies and stuff, you should uh, you should let me know. And then I'll, um, I'll I'll be sure to tell my my audience to be on the lookout for them. Thank you. Oh, you know what? I have a question for you before you've asked me all these questions. <laughs> I have a question for you. Go ahead. So I moved recently and. I'm still getting fan mail at the old house. How do I let the Star Trek fans know what my new address is? Because the people who bought our house are getting super annoyed with the Star Trek fan mail. <laughs> it keeps showing up. Oh, well. <laughs> is there's got to be like somewhere in the <laughs> online universe where you can be like, hey, everybody, I don't know how you got the address in the first place, but here's a different <laughs> one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a... I suspect that might be a, a older generation of, of fandom if they're, you know, actually like writing letters to, you know, send through the, the oh, postal yeah. system. I get, but... Oh, I get them all the time to sign, you know, the like trading cards and mm -hmm. headshots and stuff like that. So 
I think I'm gonna have to like I'm gonna go on one of like the Facebook sites and be like, hey everybody, get the word out. New address. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll try to pass that along. <laughs> well, it was great to talk to you. It really was. I had such a great time. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Well, that is gonna be it for this week. But thank you so much, you know, everyone who tuned in and checked out our interview with Caitlin Hopkins and Thank you to Caitlin for agreeing to come on board the show as a guest. We do appreciate that. Uh, as for next week, we will be talking about that Lower Deck Season 3 premiere, Grounded. I'll be in Vegas on the mobile emitter setup. So really looking forward to seeing people at Star Trek Las Vegas. And I'm really looking forward to having a new season of Star Trek to talk about with Lower Decks next week. And until next time, as always... Live long and prosper, y'all. Listen to the Text Trek podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or at text-trek.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash text-trek. And follow Fathery on Twitter at TXTrek. Please support us by liking our videos and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. Thank you and take care.